So in order to welcome us tonight, uh, our president rector, Father Phil Brown, is going to come and welcome you. Good evening. evening. Welcome to St. Mary's Seminary and University. As uh, Dr. Latham mentioned, I'm Father Philip Brown, President Rector of St. Mary's, and I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone, especially to our highly esteemed lecturer, Dr. Willie James Jennings. (laughs) The annual Dunning Memorial Lecture is a product of the Ecumenical Institute's first endowment gift given by J. Fitzgerald Dunning, one of the EI's original honorary directors. The Dunning Lecture embodies the Ecumenical Institute's motto, Faith Seeking Understanding, Understanding Making a Difference, something that this evening's presenter has surely demonstrated through his scholarship and pastoral activity. St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute is celebrating its Jubilee anniversary year, founded less than a month after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when Catholic Archbishop Lawrence Sheehan and Episcopal Bishop Harry Lee Dahl announced its opening as an ecumenical institute in which differences could be shown to enrich and unite rather than impoverish and divide, an important message for us to hear in our own time. Past Dunning lecturers have included eminent ecumenists such as Jeffrey Wainwright and Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, outstanding scripture scholars, including N.T. Wright, Amy Jill Levine, and St. Mary's own Raymond Brown, Exceptional historians such as Pulitzer Prize winner Taylor Branch, who addressed our Jubilee Convocation earlier this year, and leading theologians such as Stanley Hauerwas, Cheryl Sanders, and tonight's lecturer, Willie James Jennings. I told Dr. Latham this morning that I'm not just excited to have Dr. Jennings here this evening, I'm thrilled as I know all of you are. And so I'd like to invite Dr. Brent Latham, the Dean of the Ecumenical Institute, to come to the podium and introduce this evening's lecturer. Thank you. Uh, How many of you are here for the first time? Welcome. So you don't know that our format is that normally after I introduce the speaker, Uh, There's a lecture of about 50 or 60 minutes, and then we have 30 minutes for question and answer. I'll run the microphone, and and we really will have some some ongoing substantial engagement after the talk. You also don't know that normally I would tell you that I'm Brent Latham, the Dean of St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute. Tonight, however, I will tell you that I am the former classmate and briefly the former student of Dr. Willie James Jennings. He was a year ahead of me in graduate work at Duke, and as my fellow student, Willie was already my teacher. But he finished his dissertation quickly, and I was slow. So slow that by the time I was defending, Dr. Jennings was on my doctoral committee, still teaching me, even while he offered probing examinations of my theological performance. And what he did for me in 1999, he will do for us all tonight. Not award you the PhD, mind you, but teach you as he probes and provoke you as he instructs. Of course, I am Dean of St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute, and we are the newest academic division of America's oldest Catholic seminary. For 50 years, our vision has been to offer excellent, ecumenical, engaged theological education to everyone who wants to seek wisdom and nourish faith through accredited graduate theological education. Both our name and our vision contain a word that reminds us that there are divisions which should not be celebrated, but which cannot be ignored. That word is ecumenical. For 50 years, ecumenical has embodied a theological claim that we belong together. 
For 50 years, ecumenical has called forth a theological performance that we learn better, we are better together. For 50 years, men and women, lay, ordained, and religious, people of all races and ethnicity, from the whole span of the church, Catholic, Protestant, and non-denominational, and often from beyond the church. We, in our early years, had more Jewish students studying here than Christian students from any single denomination. And I say that especially because we've got some ICJS folks here tonight, and we welcome them. We're better together in this place. So if you're an alum of St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute, I invite you to stand. And now I invite current students to stand up with them. And now I invite everyone who's ever taken a course at St. Mary's Ecumenical Institute, which will include many of our seminarians, and, and the rest of the seminarians can stand too because they're going to take it someday. <laughs> Indeed, look around and you know we are better together. But not just because of those who are standing, but because of the, and you, and, but those who are sitting as well. And so I invite us all to, to, to sit back down. Because we need those of you who weren't standing, but are here tonight to inform our conversation. In this Jubilee 50th year, however, we have engaged very intentionally another word that reminds us that there are divisions which cannot be ignored. And that word is race. In our MLK 50 lecture, which was co-sponsored co with the Central Maryland Ecumenical Council, Dr. Freeman Habrowski spoke on holding fast to dreams. And he called us to welcome the truth, no matter how discomforting that truth is. In our opening convocation this year, Taylor Branch, author of America in the King Years, invited us to lay our fears down. And tonight, the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings will challenge us with saving Christianity from the racial state. Dr. Jennings is an associate professor, or did you get promoted? I will promote you. You gave me my PhD. <laughs> of Systematic Theology and Africana Studies at Yale University Divinity School. Dr. Jennings is a systematic theologian who teaches in the areas of theology, black church, and Africana studies, as well as post-colonial and race theory. Dr. Jennings is the author of numerous articles and, as he pointed out to the faculty, numerous YouTube videos. <laughs> of an, also the author of an award-winning commentary on Acts and of the momentous text, The Christian Imagination. Theology and the Origins of Race, which won both the American Academy of Religions Award for Excellence and the prestigious Louisville Grauemeyer Award in Religion. Reverend Jennings is also an ordained Baptist known for his powerful preaching, whether in seminary chapel or in the several North Carolina churches where he and his wife served as interim pastors. Professor Jennings has been performing theological in the classroom for 30 years, inspiring masters, students, and mentoring a new generation of PhDs. Now, what I have characterized as belonging together, as better together, Dr. Jennings has articulated much more eloquently in his book. Quote, I yearn for a vision of Christian intellectual identity that is compelling and attractive embodying not simply the cunning of reason, but the power of love, that constantly gestures toward joining, toward the desire to hear, to know, to embrace, end quote. Tonight, I invite you to settle in to hear, to know, to embrace, and to do it as we listen to the one who will help us to shape that vision and identity. As we prepare to welcome Dr. Jennings, I remind you of Dr. Freeman Habrowski's story that he told us from behind this podium. As a 12-year-old, he was sitting at the back of his church eating Oreos, listening to that man from out of town talk. And that talk by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. changed his life. 
I doubt any of you brought Oreo cookies tonight, <laughs> but I know that when the Reverend Dr. Willie James Jennings is talking, if we listen, it might just change our lives. Please join me in welcoming my friend, our speaker. I want to thank Dean Latham for that beautiful introduction. I, I don't deserve all of that, but I, I certainly appreciate it. He was a marvelous student, and now he is a fabulous administrator. So I am so thrilled to be here. I have looked forward to this this evening for quite some time since the invitation came to your fabulous uh, President Brown, to the faculty here, to the students who are doing God's work in coming to school. Uh, I am so glad to be in your presence. To the folks from the community who have wandered in here, I am so glad you're here. And I um, would like, if I may, to bring you all warmest greetings from Dean Greg Sterling, the Dean of Yale Divinity School, the faculty, the staff, and the students of my wonderful institution where we every day, like you, labor not just to understand the world, but to change it. We want to change the world, don't we? And we have a God who has showed us not only how, but that this God has already done it. <laughs> just, follow, just follow his lead. This evening, I would like to talk to you about saving Christianity from the racial state. Saving Christianity from the racial state. If I might begin with a passage of scripture, now I'm not going to preach, but I want to begin with a, a passage of scripture to help to help uh, focus our thoughts this evening. It comes from the Gospel of Luke, the eighth chapter, and just a couple of slender verses from that powerful chapter. And they may feel a bit out of context, but you will understand as we move forward why I'm reading them to you. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Jezreel asked Jesus to leave us, to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. In the 8th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we find that powerful story of Jesus casting out many demons of a man who everyone else had thought was beyond help. After Jesus had cast the demon forces out of this man, the people in the surrounding country were so stunned, so terrified, terrified of Jesus, that they asked him to leave. They could not fathom that this man, who Jesus had set free, could actually be separated from these demons. This evening, I want to explore the question of salvation and deliverance. These are theological concepts that flow out of the heart of the gospel message. But the question for us this evening is whether Christianity itself can be saved, whether Christianity can be separated from its demons. Now, this would be an absurd question to ask if it were not the case that we live in the midst of of an absurdity, a Christianity addicted to white supremacy and whiteness. We live in the midst of a Christianity 
trapped in a racial state and oppressed by its powerful demonic forces. We Christians must face the crisis of faith that is now fully upon us. That crisis has to do with how we articulate and give witness to the integrity of the gospel in and through racially divided churches and in churches that remain committed to racial ignorance and segregationist ways of living their faith and being comfortable, comfortable with the racial antagonisms that are at the very constituting foundations of the Western world. The racial state that we all live in formed at the joining, the fusion of Christianity to whiteness. Whiteness as a way of being in the world was parasitically joined to a Christianity that was also a way of being in the world. It was this fusion of these two realities that gave tragic shape to Christian faith in the new worlds at the dawn of what we now call the modern colonial era or colonial modernity, as scholars call it. It was precisely this fusing together, sisters and brothers, this fusing together of Christianity with whiteness that constitutes the ground of many of our struggles today. The struggle against aggressive nationalism is the struggle against the fusion of Christianity and whiteness. The struggle against racism and white supremacy and some aspects of sexism and patriarchy is the struggle against this fusion. The struggle against the exploitation of the planet is bound up in the struggle against this joining. So many people today see the problems of planetary exploitation, of racism, of sexism, of nationalism, and so forth. But they do not see the deeper problem of this fusion, which means they have not grasped the energy, the spiritual energy that drives many of our problems. We have always had difficulty in seeing the deeper problem of this fusion. On the one hand, many people have not been able to see this as a fusion, a joining that should never have happened. Many people collapse Christianity and whiteness into one thing, hated or loved. They cannot see two things, two mutually interpenetrating realities, the one always performing itself inside the other. On the other hand, there are just as many people who do not see this as a deep problem or even as a problem. They have made whiteness an irreversible accident of history. Or even, for some, an attribute of creation. That whiteness is a problem remains an elusive point to get across because too many people have no idea of with what to do with such an idea. Beside bewilderment, the typical responses I get to the idea that whiteness is a problem is a mixture of guilt and anger and, of course, the inevitable pushback. It is an ironic truth of Christian life that most people perform a faith, embody a faith, far more complex than they articulate. There is, my friends, there is a vastness to our faith, to our, to our lives in faith, that we cannot adequately capture with our words. 
The difficulty with the racial state and with whiteness in particular is that it has woven itself into that vastness, making seeing the fusion and seeing our way beyond the fusion, beyond the fusion, very difficult work. To speak of whiteness is not to speak of particular people, but of people caught up in a deformed building project aim at bringing the world to its full maturity. What does maturity look like, sisters and brothers? What does maturity look like? Maturity of mind, of body, of land and animal use, of landscape and building, family and government. Whiteness is a horrific answer to this question formed exactly at the site of Christian missions and used to form nation states in our common life. Whiteness formed as early European settlers, Christian settlers came to the new world and made three fundamental, fundamentally destructive decision, decisions. First, in the face of the vastness in the face of the newness and strangeness of the new worlds, they decided to try to understand those new worlds without the voice, without the vision, without the knowledge, without the wisdom of the indigenous peoples. These colonial Christian settlers believed that only they could truly understand the world. Secondly, they decided that God, our God, had given them the new worlds in order to bring the world to maturity and to life aligned with the true God. So the world, in their thinking, was their responsibility to steward, their burden to bear, and, of course, their right to rule. Thirdly, they decided that their Christian faith formed them to be the teachers of the world. The whole world, the whole world was present to them only as their students. And they were the only true global teachers. Whiteness. Whiteness grew from these fundamental decisions into which, into what we have today. Not simply nationalist forms of white supremacy. Don't get this confused. Not simply nationalist forms of white supremacy, but a vision of life. A vision of life, sisters and brothers, that always seeks to normalize ideas of mastery control and possession, mastery, control and possession flowing around white bodies. The racial state is with us because we Christians gave life to it. This is our child. It grew out of some of our deepest sensibilities, distorted them and presented them to the world as the soil on which to build a future. Christianity, in order to be saved from the racial state, must be delivered from whiteness, pulled from its identity-forming energy, and drawn away from its seductive powers. Our Christian witness at this very moment is at stake. And there are two things that we must do now. First, we must become better storytellers, sisters and brothers. Better storytellers. We, as you all know, we are a storied people. All our most important work, all that we do and say is deeply 
embedded in story. As I like to say, it's story all the way down. Our lives begin in story and they end in story. And we at this time must press more deeply into the reality of story and the holy work, the risky work, the important work of becoming better storytellers. And there are three stories. There are three stories. We must tell better. We have to tell them better. First and foremost, we must tell the story of our Gentile journey into the faith. Our Gentile journey into the faith. At the very root of the racial condition and the problem of racism and sexism is the hubris, the cancerous pride that was bequeathed to us through the church's long forgetfulness of exactly how we became Christians. We entered the story of another people. We entered the story of another people. Biblical Israel fell in love with their God, their God first, fell in love with their God, and were poised to learn from them of life with their God. They were also poised to learn from us, we Gentiles, of the expansive reality of their own God's love. That trajectory, that line of love was interrupted, stopped before it truly got started and distorted so that a faith that should have taught us two crucial lessons never got the chance, never got the chance to teach us those lessons. What are those lessons? I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> First, that we were people who were at the margins. People who were at the margins. We were what the great Catholic theologian Sean, M. Sean Copeland calls, we were a thinking margin. A thinking margin. And we were brought into the story by faith. We were people who knew what it meant and what it felt like to be outsiders. We see how the margins are formed of society, of economies, of care and concern. And we live always against that formation. We live always to bring those outside, those neglected, those forgotten, those excluded into the center of love and concern because that's how we enter. The second lesson that was to have been formed in us is the constant ongoing expansion of our identities without loss or assimilation or conquest. The expansion of our identities without loss or assimilation or conquest, but through life together, through joining. We Gentiles entered the prayer life of another and with our own voices communed with the God who loves us, all of us. The expansion of our identities would mean the sharing of our life stories, the sharing of our concerns and cares, but also the redirection of those stories into a weaving together a kaleidoscope, if you will, a cacophony of multiple sounds, sights, smells that together would give witness to the life of the creature loved by the creator. We were to be a people who knew how to form a people without destructive assimilation, but through 
ongoing, complex addition. That was our birthright. That was our legacy that we never learned. How to be a people who could form a people without killing people. These, these deep lessons of the mind, of the heart, of the body, these deep lessons were robbed of us. We were robbed of them through a modern colonial history that presented a Christianity that did just the opposite. It created margins. It killed identities. It destroyed ways of life, all in order to offer a diseased gospel. This is the first story that must be told. Most Western Christians have never been introduced to their own Gentile existence. Most have never gotten the memo that the Bible did not belong to us first. It never made it to some offices. The first story that must be told is of our Gentile existence. And most have never gotten the word that we were called to become virtuosos of joining. Virtuosos of joining. To be formed to be people who could fully and completely join themselves to other people without losing themselves or destroying the identities of others. What people would we have been had we become virtuosos in doing precisely that? We would have been like that man from Nazareth. The second story we must tell bills from this, and it is the story of whiteness. We are finally at the point, sisters and brothers, when as Christians we can understand and help people see that whiteness is a way of being in the world that is not natural, is not normal, is not in need of defense. In fact, it must be renounced. Renunciation is not first a speech act where we invite people to say they are not white. That's not what I'm talking about. Renunciation means walking away from what whiteness has meant in the world. Walking away from what whiteness has meant in the world. First, it has meant the desire to have control of your world. To have mastery of its multiple voices and visions and to have possession of its resources. Control, mastery, possession. And second, renunci renunciation means the refusal to live, or should I say, Renunciation, the renunciation that must happen, must address our refusal to live in the story of the humility of our faith as Gentiles joined to another people and with joining as a way of life. The real challenge is to learn the history of whiteness and to face the fact that whiteness is seductively attractive because it feels good. Whiteness feels it has an affective structure, affective with an A, an affective structure, like extremely comfortable clothing that moves with the body. Whiteness becomes what the theorist Ann Anley and Chin calls a second skin. Whiteness feels because whiteness never needs anyone to make a distinction between who they are and being white. Whiteness presents itself as skin and not clothing. Many of the obstacles to overturning whiteness is due to the success of its powerful affective structure. It feels normal. 
It feels natural because it is woven into how we imagine moving toward maturity. Whiteness feels normal, feels natural, and therefore always feels positive unless it is being questioned. It's the only time it doesn't feel positive. So, to question whiteness, to question whiteness feels terrible because it feels as if we are tearing at the fabric of people's lives and questioning the right of particular people to exist. To question whiteness feels like we are throwing people into chaos and fragmentation. It feels like hate, hate speech. And anyone who questions whiteness is seen as being obsessed with matters of identity, of being lost in identity politics, and having lost a sense of common purpose. But of course, the issue has never been having a common purpose. The issue has always been who gets to define the common purpose and what energies and instruments have been used to force people into a common purpose that destroys life. So from the beginning of the workings of whiteness, people have used their only weapon the only weapon consistently at their disposal to challenge that common purpose. Their bodies, their stories, their memories and hopes, all found in, yes, their identities. Questioning whiteness brings people into a forest of feelings they would prefer to escape. Feelings of guilt, feelings of fear, and a feeling overwhelmed by the sheer expansiveness, even ubiquity of whiteness's reach into our lives. The deepest anxiety of so many people is not that whiteness is inescapable, but that the feelings of whiteness are inescapable. Both its guilt and its addictive, seductive power. Whiteness feels good as long as no one tries to make it feel bad. Whiteness feels as it thinks and thinks as it feels. The first mistake we make is to fall, is to fail to recognize how much racial reasoning and racial discourse is driven by deeply entangled thought and feeling. To try to address our moment just rationally, just with reason alone, is always to make a mistake. It is both our thinking and our feeling. But to struggle against whiteness is to not deny feeling. It is to question the structure of feeling that has taught people to so deeply identify with whiteness that they cannot imagine a life. They cannot imagine a life freed from a vision of life born of whiteness and shaped inside a whole new affective structure of joy and peace. They cannot imagine what so many people of color imagine every day in hope, a life freed from the derogatory racial visions of their existence and shaped inside a new affective structure of joy and peace. Every day, people of color fight to separate the images, the racial images, the racial images from the reality of their life. And it is, a, it is a struggle that we all must enter into together. The third story we must tell is the struggle of faith for so many people of color. Hear me this evening, my sisters and brothers. The story, the struggle of faith for so many people of color, for those of us who felt and yet feel the legacy of colonialism in and on our bodies. We must remember, we must remember the struggle of the gospel given to people of color. There were three responses of people of color all over this planet 
to the Christianity offered to them by white Christian colonial settlers. Three responses. First, many people of color responded to that Christianity by rejecting it as nothing but a pack of lies, a bunch of evil nonsense. And there has always been a strong tradition among many peoples of a deep and abiding hatred of Christianity, not only because of its strong connection with the history of world-altering colonialism, but also because Christians continue to collaborate with the ongoing economic, intellectual, and ecological colonial operations of the West. Another response to that Christianity was simply to use it as a foil for affirming their own indigenous practices. This was in response to a Christianity presented at the end of a gun barrel and in the context of slavery and in the context of taking land and animal. These folks were Christians in public, but themselves in private. And they took the colonizer's religion, mixed it with their own ways of performing transcendence. And by any means necessary, by mysticisms, dirty and clean, saw deliverance and freedom. But then there was a third response. <clears throat> some people, some people in spite of all of this, became practicing Christians. This is the great miracle of modernity. This is the great miracle. Indigenous peoples all over this planet became serious Christians despite colonial Christianity. But even here there were two kinds of responses within the third response. You see there were those who became Christian in the full force of assimilation learning through that Christianity to look upon their own peoples through a derogatory gaze, shaped in suspicion, quick to dismiss, sanctioning disrespect, and sometimes, sometimes performing pure hatred of their own people. You see, we Christians, we Christians invented the modern idea of cultural backwardness. That's us. This was our virus unleashed on people after people, teaching them to judge their own peoples through a sick vision of progress. But then there was a second response in this third response. And that is those who formed a Christianity different from their colonizers, a Christianity different from their slave masters, a Christianity different from those who would put them in bondage, where they slowly tried to hold together the fragments of their worlds, weaving them into new patterns for living that resisted colonial Christianity. Now, sisters and brothers, What is important to know, what is important to know is that these three responses were not sequential, nor do they represent historical periods of response to Christianity. These responses have always been together in the same communities, in the same churches, in the same families. And sometimes, sometimes in the same people, swirling around, moving in and out of their consciousness and their ways of being in the world. Some days they believe, some day they think it's all a pack of lies. Some day they have faith, some day they hate the fact that they have faith. Some day they want to love, some day they hate the fact that they're supposed to love. In the same people. This story must be told. This reality has only intensified for so many people of color today who are trying to make sense of their Christianity, 
so bound to whiteness that it is oftentimes difficult for many to believe that they can be separated. There are Christians who don't believe that they can be separated. And the struggle of faith for them is a struggle to believe that Christianity can ever be delivered from whiteness. They can ever be delivered. It is that, it is that man filled with demons and they cannot believe that he can ever be freed because thousands of demons flow through him. We have to share together. We have to share together in the struggle together against whiteness, knowing that it is a shared struggle. What is crucial at this moment, what is crucial at this moment, is not to use, not to exploit people of color to do the difficult work of teaching the body of Christ, teaching Christians comfortable in their whiteness about whiteness. You cannot place the struggle of whiteness on those who are also struggling against whiteness. One more time. You cannot place the struggle against whiteness on those who are right now struggling against whiteness themselves. That would turn the shared struggle into a singular burden for people of color. The story we must tell involves everyone learning deeply together about the reality of whiteness. Everyone learning deeply together about the reality of whiteness. So the first thing, as I said, we must become better storytellers. Those three stories must be told better. The second thing we must do, beside becoming better storytellers, is to begin to take place seriously. As I like to say everywhere I go, because it must be said now, race Sisters and brothers, if you don't remember anything else tonight, remember this. Race has always been a matter of geography. Race has always been bound to place. Race has always been a matter of geography and whiteness always aims. Whiteness always aims aims to structure itself geographically. Again, whiteness always aims to structure itself geographically. On the ground, in the shape of communities, cities, towns, rural and urban areas, neighborhood by neighborhood, always creating geographic whiteness. Whiteness comes to rest in space. Whiteness comes to rest in place. The maturity whiteness aims at always forms segregated spaces. It forms lives lived in parallel, whether separated by miles or inches. It constructs bordered life, life lived in separate endeavors of wish fulfillment. I continue to be amazed by people who have been raised in all white communities where the presence of people of color were highly monitored and controlled and who see that habitation, they see that habitation as a naturally occurring phenomenon, like a waterfall or a rock formation. Such places breed a profound ignorance, a learned ignorance, a cultivated ignorance that conceals its deformity, denying to those so formed within those places the truth that their worlds were highly structured segregationist spaces enabled by genocide, market manipulations, city planning, 
the wishes and whims of developers, the actions of real estate brokers, and of course, the police, and the unrelenting will of whiteness to exist unencumbered by non-white people in order to challenge the segregated imagination that we have, we must first learn to tell the true story of place. Wherever I go, I encourage people to learn the history of their places. I am like a drummer beating this drum, but it must be beaten. What was here before this building? What was here before this school? Who lived here? Who was moved in order for this to be built here? But there is a wider story that we must learn, and that is the story of our city or our town, the places where we live. We must learn the history of the racial geography of our city and town. The history of the racial geography. What has been the geographic history of non-white people in this town? Where did they live? Where were they told they could and could not live? When did that change? How did that change? Has it changed? How was and is geographic whiteness organized and established spatially here? How was resistance to minority presence deployed here? It is crucial, sisters and brothers, that institutions of higher learning Colleges, universities, answer these questions, questions because such institutions create, tend to create spatial segregation or ignore the spatial segregation happening along racial lines all around their campuses. Few people who inhabit colleges or universities or seminaries know the history of the place and space on which the school sits. And even fewer see the value even fewer see the value or importance of knowing that history. But for Christians, because we believe in a God who creates and a God who has joined the divine life to the creation on the dirt and that we are that God's creation, we not only want to know but we have a theological responsibility to know, to know deeply. We need to know the history of place, the history of the dirt, the history of the land, the history of the people. We need to know this history because the social history of a place is inside the geographic history. More importantly, the root, the root, the root of most of the problems of any city or any town comes back to this geographic history, which shows us the history of the flows of goods and services, opportunities and disadvantages. It shows us where the bodies were buried, where the blood flowed, where the tears were shed, where the prayers were made, where people fell to their knees or stood in defiance. All of that we must know, we must feel. What is crucial here is to learn the truth and tell the truth. We cannot begin to address the racial disparities in this country until we acknowledge and even confess the geographic construction of disparity. The geographic construction of disparity. We need something like a truth commission for every city or town that lays out in as much detail as possible the way life has come to be shaped in particular communities, neighborhood by neighborhood. Secondly, churches and schools should involve themselves in the geographic shaping and reshaping of communities. I would love to see Christians I would love to see seminarians and ministers and priests. I would love to see rabbis and imams. I would love to see people who love God start asking questions about the placement of buildings. 
the formation of neighborhoods, the designation and mapping of spaces, about zoning policies, real estate operations, the plans of developers. Who are the developers? Most Christians I know in most places don't even know who the developers are. They don't even know who they are. Who are the developers? Such questions and reflections should be a fundamental part of curriculum in both church and the academy. We should invite everyone into discussions about the morality of geographies, asking whether we are perpetuating a violent geography by seemingly benign land development decisions of which there are none. Admittedly, I understand these matters are very complicated, but the absence of a moral compass, sisters and brothers, listen, the absence of a moral compass in these matters continues to have devastating effects on the lives of so many people. The compass that drives these matters now is controlled by local political economies calibrated to race and racial ecologies calibrated to the market. We need to invite people to imagine and build toward new forms of community and habitation. New forms of community and habitation that reverses violent geographies and challenges geographic whiteness. And finally, it is important to see the connection between space, place, and discipleship. The great Native American religious scholar and theologian, Vine Deloria Jr., once said that Christians think temporally, but they have no idea how to think spatially. What Vine Deloria Jr. was pointing toward was the historic problem of a faith offered to indigenous peoples that told them that time was far more important to God than place. After all, we wait for a new heaven and a new earth, don't we? It was and is a faith that believes strongly in the time of salvation, but has never understood fully the place, the place of salvation. We do not yet understand the redemption of place. Place and space matter to God. The tragedy we inhabit is that our visions of discipleship, its reach, its quality, its character, its reach, its quality, its character, are all controlled by the shape of our geographic imagination. And they are all short and absent in many cases. The issue here is how people imagine place and create living spaces together. How people seek to know and love their real neighbors. And my hope, my hope is that you will start to correct in your own life the grotesque absence of spatial awareness within the Christianity you and I have inherited. The salvation we proclaim as Christians is the salvation that is present to us today, my friends. As I close, I want to return to the story from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. The story I began with, that, that man, that man who was filled with demons, who sat at the feet of Jesus. Healed, healed and freed from the demons. Healed and freed from what no other person imagined he could be freed from. The God we serve is a delivering God who has reclaimed the creation and the creature as God's own possession. The only question for us is whether we will be like those who out of fear and disbelief <laughs> sent Jesus away, or whether we will be those who seek through him our own deliverance. 
Thank you very much. And please state your name and uh, what you do in the community, if you're a student or if you are um, in the community, let, let us know who you are. Thank you so much for that, and uh, I'm a student at St. Mary's. Tell, tell us your name. Put the mic close to your, the mic's not on. Let me, let me ask our, our uh, IT person to see if, if we'll work, and uh, we'll get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, and uh, I'm a student at St. Mary's Seminary. You, uh, in, in the um, uh, Christian Imagination book, you use narrative very effectively, and you talk about the need for us to tell our own stories. Yes. And for that to become a, a kind of interwoven uh, yes. fabric. Yes. Uh, could you say more about how that can be done, and particularly within African American communities? I know you said you can't place the burden on those who are resisting whiteness uh, to, uh, to also... Uh, uh, who are already resisting whiteness to mm -hmm. constantly do that. Mm -hmm. But it also seems to me that we need to tell our own stories within our own community. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not people outside of the community are receptive to those stories is something we can't control. Yes. But we can tell our own stories. And it seems to me that yes. um, uh, the movie Bill Street is going to be released later. Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. an example of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe give uh, uh, some sense of, of how we could do more of that? Yes. And the not just in terms of movie production, but mm -hmm. in terms of Yes, sir. The question was, um, uh, since I've challenged us to become better storytellers, the question was how might, especially within African American communities, we we do that important work, um, and and how might we go about um, strengthening that work in our own communities? That capture the question in it. This is this is um, I think exactly where the work has to be done. There there are two things we must be aware of right now. Um, we are losing so many people who remember. Who remember the struggles of the 60s, who remember the Jim Crow world. We're losing so many of them. And the crucial first task, my sisters and brothers, all of us, this is not just for the African American community, but the crucial task for us is to get their stories down. Get their stories down. So much of what we know generally come, uh, about the history of African Americans struggling in this country comes from um, a happenstance, if you will, the WPA project <laughs> that um, in order to put people back to work, sent people throughout the South to, to record the testimony of people who had been slaves or children during slavery. And even with all the corruptions in those materials, because some, some things were not written, some things were changed, some things were lied about, uh, even with that, we still received treasure with that. Well, at this crucial moment, we are, we are losing people who what they have in their heads cannot be replaced. And so one of the most important tasks in front of us especially given the technology we have now, is take your elders, get the youngest members of your families, give them a little money and say for the next two months, you record everything grandma says. Even if she repeats herself 17 times, you record it. And then you tell me back what she said. We need those stories. I, I want it so badly for Ken Burns to have done a documentary on the late Gardner C. Taylor. I, I wanted so, because his life spanned, yes, yes. it spanned the 20th century. Yes. When he was a boy, he knew people who had been slaves. Yes. And all of that was in him and nobody Wrote it down. Nobody recorded. Somebody should have put a microphone in him and just said, for the next three years, I'm going to pay you your full salary. Just talk, Dr. Taylor. Just talk. 
So that's the first thing we need. We need this. But the second thing we must do, we must, we must honor the truth among ourselves. We must honor the truth and not be afraid of the truth. Internalization is real. And we, we have to tell the truth and speak the truth in story of what centuries of white internalization has meant for us. Tell that story. Write it down. Thank God for the poets among us and the and the, the uh, creative writers and, and the musicians and the rappers, so many of the artists who are capturing fragments of it. But this is holy work. This is Christian work. And we ought to be engaged in this holy work, not alone, but together. As I like to say, the point of a Christian in their work of holy storytelling, holy story learning. The point is not that I know my story and honor my story and remember my story. The point is that you know my story, honor my story and tell my story and I know your story and honor that story. This is the gift of being a Christian, not that I just know my story. You know, I went to a, a Dutch Christian college, and I claim part of that story is my own. They always look at me strange when I tell them the story of our immigrants who came in the late 1800s, and then the story of our other immigrants who came in the early 19, uh, early 20th century. It's my story now, too. But this, this is what a Christian is supposed to be, someone who lives inside of other people's stories, not steal them, not steal them, not exploit them, but live them. So you can look at me and say, my grandmother lives in you. And I can look at you and say, she lives in you because you know the story now and you honor it. That's the work. That's the work ahead of us. here and then back here. I'm going to ask you to, as, as was requested, stand, say your name, and keep your questions relatively brief. Okay. <laughs> uh, Rufus Lusk, uh, Yale Divinity School, 1974 professor. Thank you so much for being here. It was a fan fantastic lecture. If I got it right, I'm a retired Lutheran pastor. Uh, if I got it right, you were saying to us that whiteness is an idolatry. Yes. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out yes. of Egypt. You shall have no other gods, and whiteness is an idolatry. Yes. Everything, it seems to me, follows yes. from that. Now, we're in a political situation yes, we where are. we have an idolater in chief. Yes. We have an idolater in chief. Yes, yes, to, yes. to me, to me, the, the worst thing, he's a, he's a total pagan. Yes, he's a yes. total hedonist. But he, wait a minute, is an idolater. <laughs> So I, what I what I what I, what I want to ask what I want to ask is how how we how we help those who are in lock stock and barrel 110 percent and think that that is a religious act. Yeah. I don't I don't know how to talk to them. Please help us, Professor. That's a that's a great question. And friends, we are we are in that moment. We are at that moment where. Um, our, our spiritual disciplines are being tested profoundly. Um, we do have someone in leadership in this country who craves attention. And, and your, your, your um, notion of an idolater is very powerful because the key to idolatry is our attention, isn't it? That's the key to idolatry, our attention. So here is the, here is the challenge. How do we stay profoundly engaged politically and socially and economically without granting attention to the idol? That, that's the challenge. How do we not give to him what he desperately wants is our constant attention. And unfortunately, I, I, have, I have all the respect for our journalists, but they are shaped inside giving attention. They want our attention 
and he wants our attention. So they, they are in a sick relationship right now. And we have to find a way not to allow ourselves, not to allow ourselves to be caught up. And I have a, I have a colleague who said, you know, he realized he was an addict. He was watching the news during the day when he used to never watch it. Like he, he was just addicted to it. He said, he realized I've become an addict. It's like, what is he going to do next? What is he going to do next? I said, no. it's precisely this work that we have to think again. And how do we do that? We turn our attention toward each other. We turn our attention toward the real concrete needs of our community. And we keep our eyes on the larger needs around us. But we find a way to, to even though this image is in front of us, we find a way to look around it so we can see what's actually there. It's difficult because we've never had anyone in our lifetime in the White House who is so attuned to drawing our attention and so in need of it. And so we have to find ways to see each other. There, there is there's an important lesson we learn from icons. Meditating with an icon is important at this moment because icons resist depth perception. They come out to you, right? So they invite you not to look into them, but to allow them to come out to you and reshape the very way you understand your world. And so there's a sense in which we, we have to resist being drawn deeply into his, his logics. I mean, yesterday, as you all know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a PBS news watcher, and what he said to the poor African-American reporter, Lamish Alcindor, was so hurtful to me. But I, I realized at that moment what I had to do was to pray. I had to pray for her first, that God would continue to give her strength, and pray that I would not allow myself to be lost inside him. We cannot afford to be lost inside him now, sisters and brothers. Yes, my dear brother. Timothy Tillman, um, uh, EI grad, uh, 2017. And uh, it, you brought to mind the words of uh, Dr. Cohn, James Cohn. Ah, yes. And, and James Baldwin. And, yes. And James Baldwin, when talking about whiteness and racism in his uh, speech preceding the March on Washington, says, yes. the really sad thing is we have to love them. Yes. Because they have no other hope. Right. Now, I understand that intellectually, mm -hmm. but after you've been beat down for 400 and some odd years, it's kind of hard to do that. And mm -hmm. you talked about the what and the information that's stacked inside of that. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about the how. That's a great question. And, and I would recommend um, Baldwin's work, and especially he wrote a beautiful little piece, a letter to his nephew, in which he beautifully talked about this very thing. Well, my, my dear brother, this is, this is a crucial point for us. Here we, we, have, to, we have to allow ourselves fully to rest in what we believe, in the, in the presence and power of the Spirit. You know, in the book of Acts, there's there's two things about the, the book of Acts that are just that have always amazed me, and I just did this commentary, and it's helped me see this so clearly. The one thing in the book of Acts is that almost almost no one is doing what they want to do. <laughs> almost everyone is being compelled by the Spirit to do exactly what they don't want to do. So the sign of the Spirit's presence is that the Spirit is asking you to do what you don't want to do. <laughs> and primarily what the Spirit wants you to do, when you look at the book of Acts, what the Spirit wants people to do is to go to people they don't want to go to. The, the Spirit is pressing people together who don't want to be together. And you gotta remember, th 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 there, is a, there is a profound Christological, a profound template for that. It is Jesus and the crowd, right? The crowd 
in the New Testament that surrounds Jesus are always made up of people who hate each other, who don't want to be next to each other, but they have to be next to each other in order to get to Jesus. So they're, uh, I hate this person, but I want what he got. But I hate this person. <laughs> get out of my way. Jesus, mm. come here, Jesus. Mm, mm. Jesus, son of man, come and help me. <laughs> When you when you read in the Gospels, it's always the the crowd. The crowd is that motley crew who don't want to be together. But in order to be with you, and what we know is that Jesus, by his life and by his ministry, says that's this is exactly what I want. I want those who want me to want each other. So the Spirit is pressing, pressing us pressing us to go toward those who we prefer not to. And the, the key, that what Baldwin was, was pressing toward, but obviously he couldn't given his complicated relationship with Christianity. But what Baldwin was pressing toward was precisely the yielding to the spirit that we all resist. This is the other thing about the book of Acts. How easy it is for us to resist the spirit to push against what the spirit is doing i am convinced that most of us i think all of us in this room the spirit is constantly pressing us to come to know someone who is in our life that we refuse to do so we see them every day maybe every week but we know that we many of us at that moment i just said it that person popped in your head and you know yep Yep, 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 that dude, right? That, yeah, that woman. Ooh, girl. And this, this is the reality of it. Love is not something we have to create. Love is not something that we have to figure out logistically how to do. Love, God's love, is at, at the space, at the place of yielding. It's at the place of yielding, to yield to what God wants to do with you. This is why, this is why the racial condition is so insidious, because it blocks us from hearing the Spirit of God speak to us. That's the problem we're facing. So I, I understand, you know, the, you know, loving people is difficult, but remember, God is not working with you at the level of loving everyone. God is working with you at the level of loving that one who you ignore. And if Christians did that, that would constitute everyone. Yes, yes my dear brother. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jennings. Uh, Derek Miller, I'm a student here at, um, at the Ecumenical Institute and um, also work for an organization that seeks to address and bring light to what you call uh, geographic constructs of disparity. Yes, yes. yes. Um, particularly as it addresses health issues here in our city. Amen. Um, and so I have a question about, uh, you, you connected space mm -hmm. and discipleship. Mm -hmm. And in Luke 8, there is also a cost to that liberation. So part of the reason that the people are afraid is not just that this person who is right in the right mind, but they lost all of their pigs. Yeah, the they lost yeah. their economy. Right. There's a cost to liberation. There's a cost yes. to addressing right. these disparities. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if you could speak to part of my vested interest is trying to get faith communities to recognize that there is a cost to their discipleship. Yes. If they're to address these disparities that they're wrapped up in, that they've contributed to, that there's a cost to their own liberation as yes. well. Um, yes. What is the cross that we right. bear? What is the cost of our disciples? That's a great question. The, 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 the place I want to put emphasis in terms of cost, and I think you're exactly right, is the cost of the ignorance and the lack of knowing. So, so let me explain what I mean by that. I want Christians to simply understand what real estate people understand. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it, and there are so many Christians who don't even understand what real estate people understand. They don't understand price points, how houses get designated at this cost. They, they don't understand um, how the market works at the local level. And so 
they don't know where to place their bodies to intervene. That's all I want. There is a meeting that happens in every town, every town, and you can see it on public public uh, television. It's that meeting where the city commissioners sit. Some, they're called different things in different communities, and there's, they're, they're sitting there, and then they scan the room, and the room is empty. There's maybe two people there. And, you know, those are the most important meetings in a community. Those are the most important moral meetings in a community because those are the meetings that decide Price points for houses, how much these houses will, will cost, the, the, where sidewalks will be, where bus routes will be, where, you know, where the police station will be. Th- those are the crucial meetings that require us to be there. And so the cost is to be there. The cost is to find out where you intervene. You see, the fear, the fear is that the money will either be taken or the money... We can keep our money. Either we'll keep it or someone will take it from us. And that fear is fundamentally irrational. What's really at stake is knowing where to place your body to say to people how this economy must work for everyone. That's, the, that's where the fight is. The fight is to say, you can, I will not allow you in a room alone with just a few other people to decide the fate of the community. I was in another city, and I won't tell you where I was because you, you'll figure it out, but I was in another community, and a pastor went to one of these, one pastor, he had, he had went to downtown and actually read the city report of the, kind of the future plans of development. Go, go figure, he had read the report. He showed up to this meeting, and he started asking questions. The mayor was there and some others were there. He started asking questions. And then when the meeting was over, they called him into the back room, the mayor and city commissioners and a few of the developers. And the mayor spoke for him. He said, the mayor said to this pastor, what do you want? <laughs> he was just asking questions. He didn't want anything. He just was asking, why are you going to do that? Why are you going to move the, those people? Why are you going to put, well, what, what do you want? What, what, what slice of this do you want? So all I want, the first cost, is to be there, sisters and brothers. You ought to understand the way, you ought to feel, as a, as a community, you ought to feel the way Baltimore works. Feel it. Feel, how does, how does it flow? How does it work? Where is the money? Where is the desire? Who wants to change what? Christians ought to feel that and know that and Place their bodies right where decisions will be made that will make life very difficult. I can tell this one quick story and then I'll come to the next question. So there was a community where this kind of meeting was happening that I just mentioned. There was this area where these kids played in a dirt field. It was their field. They put up basketball courts. This is where they played. They were having a good time. Poor kids, but this is where they played. This was their space. A meeting happened where they decided that they were going to turn that space into a bit of a strip mall. So they put a building, concrete, tall fence, surrounded it, lights. The kids said, no, this is our space. So kids do what kids do. They climbed the fence. They planted their feet down on that concrete. They put up their little courts, and they had a good time. But now it was private property, and now they were trespassing. The police came, the usual story. Misunderstanding, the usual story. Somebody moved when they shouldn't, the usual story. Somebody pulled a weapon too quickly, the usual story. And a mother was crying, the usual story. Now, here's the question, sisters and brothers. When did it go wrong? Did it go wrong when the police officer pulled his gun? Did it go wrong when the kids climbed the fence? No, it went wrong when you and I were not at the meeting when they decided to make it a strip mall. 
that's when we were not there. We were, should have been there to say, no, not this way, a different way. Yes, go ahead, next question. I, th I think we have, uh, oh my goodness. Uh, we, we are near the end of our time and I uh, want us to have broken the gender barrier, so. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Take, okay. take your time. Take your so time. my name is Cherie it. Gale, and I am about to defend my master's thesis at Loyola University in theology, so thank you. Um, I also work as an assistant director in student life at Loyola University. Oh, wonderful. And uh, I thank you for everything that you provided us with tonight. So many great tokens being... Um, virtuosos of addition mm -hmm. as Christians. There were so many great things that you said. My question for you is this. Um, so there are, a lot, I, there are a lot of warnings, a lot of direction that you provided, which is so needed and so good. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you could flesh out a little bit more a vision or a picture of what it would look like to not acquiesce to the sin of white supremacy. Yeah. And not just for for people of color or minorities, but for anyone. Yeah. What is that vision? What are we moving towards? What does it look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll tell a story of a dear friend of mine. He always gets embarrassed when I tell a story, but I'll, I'll tell the story. His, his name is Mike Broadway. He's a, a professor and a minister in Durham, North Carolina. He, for his entire career, he's taught at Shaw Divinity School predominantly black divinity school tied to Shaw, the great Shaw University. When his children were young, <clears throat> Mike is white. His wife is white. His children are white. <laughs> Make sure you get all that right. <laughs> when his children were young, he left the white Baptist church and he joined our Baptist church, a black Baptist church. And the folks at the White Baptist Church said, why are, you, why are you doing that? You don't belong there. He said, I do belong there. God has called me to be with my people. And they said to him, you know, your children will suffer. Your children will suffer. And he said, my children won't suffer. But even if they were going to suffer, this is what it means for me to be a Christian disciple. Now his children didn't suffer. But he came. He didn't come to teach. He didn't come to lead. He didn't come to instruct. He came to be a Christian brother. And he, he gave his life. He, to this day, he yet goes to my church back in Durham. He fully gave himself to this community. And he learned, he listened and he learned. And when he had opportunity to teach, he taught, but he taught as somebody who was one with us, right? Wow. And his children grew up with my children together. Mm -hmm. And this, and he never called attention to himself. He never said, look at me, heroic white guy living with me, black folks. He said, no, this is just my family. And he became someone who people who would never have trusted a white man trusted, ever. He became a brother. Yeah, that's just a little taste of a slight example of somebody who did it. He didn't do it because it was the moral thing to do. He loved us. Did you want to say it? In these matters, if you do it, it's like I say with people trying to do multicultural churches today. If, if you do it because it's the right thing to do, you do a thing because it's the moral thing to do, that'll last about 16 months. <laughs> and then you will completely burn out and say, I've had enough of this. 
The only sustained form of life together is one based on I want to. I love you and I want to be with you. That, that's, that's the ground. That's the ground. Of course, not many of us want to touch such holy ground. Perhaps this night our feet are touching holy ground. 